All right, well, just from my background, um, uh, I worked on uh, forages uh, in northern areas, specifically New York, uh, for 45 years. Uh, we are still continuing uh, to work on it. Uh, we're doing a lot of work now in sorghum. Uh, we've done a lot of work in sorghum species. Uh, we have some new breakthroughs that I'd like to go over with you uh, later in the talk. Uh, there's some new research coming out now that is uh, really sort of uh, groundbreaking uh, that opens up the potential for sorghum uh, in a very big, big way. So the main thing that we got into early on is that successful livestock production is growing energy, protein, digestible fiber, sufficient amounts, and low enough cost. It's not just corn and alfalfa. There is a lot of crops out there that can do that. Now in the sorghums, the brown midrib gene, BMR gene, uh, has higher fiber digestibility. Uh, we target those for milking livestock and beef that you wanna put gains on. The non-BMR has a lower fiber digestibility, but what we found, it's perfect for uh, replacement heifers. Uh, if you're growing replacement heifers and you're feeding them BMR, they're gonna be a bunch of little porkers. They're gonna get real fat and not put on a lot of milk producing ability. Uh, going to a non-BMR, it grows a really good frame without getting them fat. Uh, the farmers who have done this reported that they are not going back to corn silage for their heifers. They're staying uh, with the non-BMR. It works very well. Now, BMR sorghum, uh, it's planted after winter forage and after your haylage. So it balances your workload out. You know, the, the old classic is the first nice day in the spring, you're a week behind. The second nice day, you're two weeks behind. Well, this comes after winter forage and comes after your haylage. It has a very fine root system. It's not like corn that has a coarse root system. It has a fine root system. So it's additionally adding to improve your soil structure, your soil health. There's a lower cost per acre. This is just ballpark numbers, uh, but sorghum uh, typically is about $20 an acre. Some of the corn varieties now are running over $170 an acre. So on a cost per acre basis, it really works well. Uh, it wipes out corn rootworm. Uh, people are trying to buy expensive genetic varieties and use an insecticide to control rootworm. If you grow one year of sorghum, uh, you don't have any rootworms for about two years afterwards. You definitely don't have it one year after, and the second year, it's not economical levels. No processing is needed. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's actually counterproductive to run sorghum species through a processor. First of all, we'll talk about this later, the seeds are too small to be processed. Secondly, those seeds are so hard, they don't digest. But thirdly, you're turning this porridge into soup uh, your, or applesauce is what you're making out of it. Uh, you're gonna have tremendous amount of leachate. Uh, it makes a real mess out of the feed. Now in our area, we have quite a few deer that are a problem in corn. Uh, deer like sorghum, they hide in it and come out and eat the neighbor's corn uh, because it doesn't, it has the prussic acid in it and they take a bite out of it when it's a small plant and it gives them an upset stomach, but they don't wanna eat it. We've gone into very high deer areas and pulled off tremendous crops simply because they don't care to eat it. It's also drought and heat tolerant. Uh, I'm down in Tennessee, that gets to be more important. Uh, up in Minnesota, it's less of an issue, but it still can be an issue uh, in that uh, the temperature can get up there. But the bigger factor is, is it's drought uh, tolerance. And then finally, as I said, uh, the non-BMR is excellent low cost forage for growing replacement heifers without getting them fat. Uh, we've run a number of trials and I just picked off some numbers of varieties and these don't have to be the varieties you use. Uh, this is right up uh, at Minor Institute, which is an hour south of Montreal. We had our variety trial for sorghums and sorghum sedans. Right next to it, they had a corn variety trial of the mean yield of the corn and the maximum yield of the corn was lower than these varieties I picked off. 
you could have picked off almost any variety from any company out of our trial, and you would have seen the same type of results. It can really yield. Hey, Tom, when you're, when you're talking about BMR sorghum, are you talking about forage sorghum or sorghum sedan? Yes. It can be either one. Okay. Either one. It's the, the, the gene for digestibility is the main thing I'm talking about. So, and I'll be talking about sorghum sedan and sorghum here, but as I move further down, I'll start to separate those two pieces out because there are advantages and disadvantages to each one. Gotcha, thank you. Uh, yep, well, and this slide actually shows it here. Uh, this is forage sorghum uh, on an inch of water or how many tons that'll be produced on an inch of water. Corn produces one ton on an inch of water. Uh, forage sorghum is 70% higher. Uh, sorghum sedan is 50% higher. Uh, Non-BMR sorghum sedan is almost 100. It's 90% higher yielding on the same water. And we have seen this very clearly in dry conditions, hot and dry, uh, the crop really shines. The reverse, if it's really cold and rainy, it's not going to do so well and your corn will do better. That's why we grow both crops. We don't put all our eggs in one basket. We spread our risk. A huge piece we have seen with this is protection of the environment. When you look at corn on the left, uh, it's bare ground a month after planting. That means that soil is getting pounded by the rain. If it's on a slope, it's gonna be washing. The good parts are gonna be leaving. The stones are gonna be staying behind. Uh, if you look on the right, sorghum sedan, three weeks after planting, it's a solid stand. It intercepts that raindrop impact, stops it from pounding it, stops the water from eroding the soil. So it keeps the soil on the field where you need it. Now, the big, big problem with sorghum sedans and with sorghums, forage sorghums, is lodging. Uh, this is a 26 ton to the acre sorghum a variety of nitrogen trial I had in. Uh, this picture was taken about a week before harvest. Uh, it's a mess. Uh, I could still chop it, I'll go into that later, but it's not what we want. Uh, you can control this by plant population, where it'll be giving you some popular uh, seeding rate data, and by genetics, uh, brachytic dwarfs and male sterile. I'll talk about the male sterile later, uh, the brachytic dwarf is a shorter, stockier plant. It's sort of like comparing a football, uh, uh, I mean, a basketball player who's seven feet tall and weighing them up against a football linebacker that's only six foot tall. That linebacker is going to outweigh the basketball player. The brachytic dwarf will outweigh uh, a, a taller, thinner plant. It's not a dwarf. It's a brachytic dwarf. A true dwarf is grain sorghum, as you see in the lower right picture, that might get to be chest high. Uh, the brachytic dwarf is gonna get twice as high. It shortens the internodes. And so it lets this plant uh, get uh, up there, produce the yield without lodging. Here are two pictures. Uh, the uh, one on the right and the left uh, are the brachytic dwarfs. The one in the middle is the standard genetic sorghum that would be about 11 feet tall. And so that centerpiece goes down, the ones on either sides tend to stand. If you harvest it on time, that is critical. It will lodge, we took a brachytic dwarf, took it up to early soft dough stage, which I'll talk about later. And then we let it go a week later and we had about 40% lodging. There is a time and a place for everything, and this needs to be harvested on time. The other issue is for organic farms. Uh, we don't recommend the brachytics because it'll often take up to two weeks for them to get out of the ground. The non brachytic is going to jump up out of the ground if you're using a stale seed bed, planting it right, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It'll get out of the ground a whole lot faster. So for the uh, organic, we don't recommend or suggest the brachytic. It takes too long to get out of the ground. 
Now, we were very excited about photoperiod sensitive sorghum. I said, hey, there's no head on it. Uh, it's not going to go down on us. Uh, it'll produce really good tonnage. So we did a bunch of work with it, and we have walked completely away. Uh, not to insult my host here, but if you have a photoperiod sensitive, we are not excited about it. This picture is the photoperiod sensitive in the variety trial. It went down like a rock. Uh, it really lodged badly, and we haven't figured out why. We did everything right. The other pieces that we found with it, it doesn't head, which is okay, but it doesn't dry down either. It just keeps growing. And so we're always at 17, 18% dry matter, which is horrible to get dry down enough for making a decent silage. It also doesn't increase the energy concentration, which you're gonna see something very different at the end of this talk. But the photoperiod sensitive just keeps producing growth and it doesn't increase the uh, concentration of nutrients uh, in uh, the forage itself. So for that reason, we did a bunch of work with photoperiod. We were really excited about it and we have backed off for those reasons. Um, the other piece is, if you look here, these top two lines are the forward or period sensitive, a BMR and a non-BMR, and they have higher NDF. Uh, in other words, they have more fiber in them uh, without the di digestibility of that fiber. Okay, looking at other sorghum options. There's the dry stalk. A dry stalk is a gene that they can add into the crop and they have this in sorghum, they have it in sorghum sedan. It increases the dry matter two or three points, which helps you get up over that edge so you can make silage uh, that isn't gonna be too wet. Uh, we have the male sterile, which I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. And then we have the BMR sorghum sedan or the non-BMR sorghum sedan. Sorghum sedans will get tall, so you can chop them, you can round bale them if you have processing knives on your baler. So they work pretty good, but we haven't used them for grazing. If you're gonna be grazing, we strongly suggest you look at the sedan grasses. They work well for grazing. They can get round baled. You can do multi-cuts relatively easy. Yes, you can do multi-cuts with a sorghum sedan, but it gets to be a taller plant. Uh, and so uh, for the yield that we want, We'll come back to that a little later, but if you're going to be grazing it and multi-cutting it, the sedan grass works really well. The other one is pearl millet, BMR pearl millet. I know it's not a sorghum, but we kind of group that in with the sorghums. It works amazingly well as a grazing crop and round baling and multi-cut. So if those are your pieces, they fit well. If you're a grazing uh, organic operation, and you need something to feed in the winter. Uh, these are two, the sand grass and the pearl millet are two crops that you can handle uh, with a mower and a baler uh, and in siling it for the winter time. On the left here uh, is a brachytic dwarf sorghum sedan that we put in. That's why it's running a little behind the sedan grass. Uh, and it in a two cut system at 35% dry matter, it was 19 tons to the acre. The sedan right next to it in a two cut system was 16 tons to the acre. The pearl millet right next to the sedan grass was 14 tons to the acre. But pearl millet has higher uh, NDFD digestibility. It'll yield a little less, but it has some good digestibility. And um, you may want to look into when you're buying, setting up seed to supply your customers here, uh, you may want to look at what uh, University of Nebraska has. They've been doing some real innovative breeding with a pearl millet. You may want to offer that for your customers. Hey, Tom, where, where are a lot of these uh, pictures and research coming from? Can you kind of give a little con locational context about where this information is coming from? 20 miles south of Albany, New York. Gotcha. So we are right up almost as far north as you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so pretty comparable to the upper Midwest here. Very comparable, yeah. I only moved to Tennessee last year. So uh, everything you're seeing, except for some of the male sterile at the end, uh, is all New York 
uh, and also work that is done at Minor Institute, which is up by Plattsburgh, New York, which is 20 minutes from the Canadian border, very far north, as far north as any of your customers would have been. Mm -hmm. So it's very apropos. Sure. And there was a question, and maybe you'll get into this a little bit later, but uh, can sorghum, sorghum sedans be mixed with any other species for, you know, dry hay, silage, et cetera? Uh, the good news is I've tried that. The bad news is you have to listen to me for about five more slides, and then you'll have it. <laughs> nice. Okay, good. So we a good question, though. Uh, the things we were looking at, and I'll show you in a, in a few minutes. Cool. Uh, sorghum sedan. Uh, with 60, 75 pounds the acre nitrogen. Uh, it has good digestibility. If you look at the NDFDs on this, uh, it's better than an 82 day corn. Uh, it was, uh, it ranks right up there. This is good feed. This is in a multi-cut system. So you can use it in a multi-cut system and get good quality feed. I personally prefer a sorghum sedan or a sedan grass over corn in an organic system for the simple reason is they're out there, I, and I work with organic farmers, they're out there cultivating the corn when they're supposed to be chopping their hay. And so their hay comes in late because it's the same weather, but you have to have decent weather to cultivate. They're out there cultivating the corn, they don't get their hay on time, and they lose their shirt on the hay uh, for what they're gaining in the corn. Uh, so we would rather see them using a sorghum sedan or a sedan grass or a pearl millet or the male sterile uh, sorghum that I'm talking about later. We'd rather see them use that because they don't have to cultivate. That allows them to get their hay in on time or haylage in on time. So they have the high quality that they need to get that production out of those animals without trying to kill themselves on the workload. Uh, we did do some work. This is back, like I said, I've been doing this for a long time. Um, we did work with a multi-cut, two-cut BMR sorghum sedan, uh, and then converted it into pounds of milk per acre. Uh, and we also did this after winter triticale. Uh, that's why we got into sorghum. We wanted to crop the plant after triticale and before triticale. Uh, so we were doing work with this uh, and looking at what a corn crop at 21 tons of the acre right next to it did. That was the milk production from the corn crop is right here. Uh, the sorghum sedan and the triticale together uh, equaled or exceeded uh, the corn crop uh, for the milk production. Now mixes. I got excited about this. I said, what if we took the sorghum sedan and mixed in summer peas? That would raise our protein level. The peas would climb up on the sorghum and would give us two crops. The bottom line is it did not work. Uh, the peas, when they got out of the ground, uh, didn't grow very fast. The sorghum sedan blew right by it. This is right up near the Canadian border. Uh, it was a huge disappointment for us. The other piece we were looking at is, okay, we had winter kill. Our alfalfa winter kill, we had ice sheets and everything else, it was dead. We come to the springtime, there's nothing out in that alfalfa field. What if we planted forage oats, no-till into the alfalfa, use that nitrogen to produce the forage oats, and then come back after the forage oats and no-till in sorghum, uh, a sorghum species, sorghum sedan or sorghum, uh, no-tilled into the oat stubble. So we tried it. And the results was a spectacular failure. Uh, this was fallow and planted the sorghum. This is where the oats was harvested and they planted directly across everything. There was little or no sorghum growing in where the oats was. It has tremendous allelopathic effect against sorghum, which was a real shocker to all of us. But all was not lost. We repeated again the next year. Uh, and this is right up by the Canadian border. That's Vermont in the background. Oops, sorry. Uh, and what we did is we disc once, lightly, lightly. You don't need to dig the china. Just skimming over, taking an inch of soil and chewing it up a little bit to break the allelopathy. And we went right over the oat stubble. And then we planted the whole thing, the sorghum, 
and the sorghum grew very well where we lightly harrowed the field or lightly tilled the field to break the allelopathy from the oats. So that was our answer. You know, it hit us in the head the first year, and then we stepped back and took another shot at it and got it figured out. The other piece that came in uh, that we didn't realize when we were first doing this work uh, is the allelopathy. Uh, this is a field that has allelopathy after triticale harvest. They came in and they no-tilled in. That should work really slick. It bombed out tremendously. Uh, there is a allelopathy on uh, sorghum uh, on from triticale to the sorghum or sorghum sedans that follow it. So if you do if you do use uh, triticale or rye or anything else, and then come in and no-till your uh, sorghum into it, don't beat up the seed dealer. It's not their fault. They didn't sell you bad seed. They sold you very good seed. The system you planted into does not allow it to work. Uh, this was another study that I did. Uh, this is down near Albany, New York. This was planted into fallow ground. The same load of seed on the other side of a six foot wide uh, alleyway the same soil, everything was the same, planted within five minutes of each other. And this was the limited growth where it was planted into the previous winter grain. That's allelopathy in action. The fact that we got that good of a stand in the allelopathic picture uh, is amazing to me, uh, but uh, it did work in this situation. Uh, but the point is there is allelopathy uh, in, uh, 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 from winter grains going to sorghum sedan. Again, a very light harrowing, a very light disking will break up that half inch of soil that has the allelopathy and eliminate it. So if you are coming into this, spread your manure and immediately right behind it, run the disk to capture the nitrogen because there's a lot of nitrogen in manure being lost. Uh, you do it within an hour of spreading, you'll capture that nitrogen you'll break up the allelopathy and your sorghum, sorghum sedan and pearl millet will grow very fine. On the other end of the season, uh, if we came in and no-tilled triticale into sorghum sedan, it works very well. The top picture is sorghum, the bottom picture is a sorghum sedan, uh, and uh, we no-tilled our triticale into it, uh, both the triticale and the sorghum uh, our sorghum sedan regrew until the first frost. The sorghum sedan in the lower right picture here uh, all got killed in the frost, but it protected the drying winds from hitting the triticale and the triticale kept right on growing and it did very well. Come springtime, the dead sorghum sedan or sedan grass or whatever it is uh, had all collapsed and the triticale was above it so we could mow the whole thing. Now, growing and harvesting uh, BMR sorghum species. There are some key steps in here uh, that we have worked on. Uh, my job was to make the mistakes so you don't make them. So I've made a lot of mistakes in this. As one of my comedian farmers said, well, yeah, we do your professional screw up. Uh, that's all right. He, then he said, and we're glad you do it so we don't make the mistakes. Oops. Hey, Tom, just real quick, when you were talking about summer peas, you're referring to, to cow peas, correct? Yes, yes. Okay. And at what, what growth stage were the oats and triticale removed at? Were they pretty young or were they fully mature or what? Uh, the oats was removed at flag leaf stage. Triticale was the same. Gotcha. And Do you think there's still... a different allelopathic response based on growth stage or is it? Uh, no. Uh, even when we did it later, the allelopathy is still there. Uh, if you get a tremendous amount of rain, it tends to leach it out. That's what happened in that one picture. But with normal rainfall, it'll sneak up and bite you in the butt every time. So yeah. that's why we suggest a light tillage uh, to break that allelopathy up. There was a grower that added in to kind of support that. I uh, said I have the same issues with growers trying to no-till sorghum sedan into trit triticale pea stubble, about one to 5% growth on the sorghum sedan. Uh, yep. One pass with a disc to carry that issue, so. Yep, it would, it would, very much so, yes. 
Yes. Okay. Uh, sorghum is best planted with a modern drill. Now, the research farm I ran uh, didn't have a modern drill. <laughs> it had a 1957 John Deere uh, drill uh, that we, that's all we had for equipment. So that's what we use. But a, a modern drill like this will do a better job. Uh, you want to plant it about an inch deep. But with any drill, it's starting with this $20,000 Great Plains drill compared to our old uh, John Deere drill from the 1950s. This is a problem in sorghum, sorghum sedan, sedan grass. The, the accordion type drop tubes bend, catch the seed, and then dump it all into a pile. And this is critical with the sorghum sedan and the sorghums, uh, that clump will come up. They grow in stiff competition. And once they start to get tall, they're weak, they fall over and they start knocking everything else down around it. So it ends up ruining your stand simply because it wasn't planted uniformly. It needs to be planted uniformly. Uh, this is the accordion type tube that catches it. Almost all the drills had them on it. This is a sleeve type uh, tube. It slides straight up and down. They're, they're like coffee cups with the bottom cut out and stacked together. They slide straight up and down. They don't catch the seed. They drop it straight down. It made a huge difference. Our 1957 drill did a better job than the brand new Great Plains drill because we put these sleeve tubes on there. Uh, with sorghum, you need it uniform in the field. Uh, this is where you can order them from. I don't have any business arrangement. I've never even met Phil. I've talked to his wife on the phone when I ordered my tubes, and that's as far as I've gone. But that's where you can get sleeve tubes that do a good job. Uh, some of the drills, like this Landall, have two tubes sliding inside of each other, but they work very well to do a uniform seed drop. And this is what you get. You get uniform pieces all the way across. Uh, work that was done with small grains, and really sorghum is a small grain, uh, but up in Michigan, uh, they reduced the variability of seed depth, the variability in spacing, improved the stand 24%, increased the yield at one site 9%, increased the other at 15%. Uh, this was with a small grain, I think it was either oats or triticale. But the point is you need that same criteria for sorghum. In matter of fact, it's needed even more so. Uh, where we did it, singulated versus drill with triticale, excuse me here, I'm bouncing around. Uh, singulated seed with triticale, we had a 22% yield increase. I'd like to get a hold of a singulated drill so I can get the yield data for drilled versus singulated uh, on sorghum. I think it's even higher than that based on what I have seen going on in fields. Now, when it comes time to plant, the soil needs to be 60 degrees and warming, and it needs to be warming for two weeks afterwards. This usually happens after your haylage is all done. So it's nice, your haylage is done, you can go ahead and get your sorghum in. Uh, that's what we did here. We put in our plots, uh, and then two weeks afterwards, we came in and we planted our alleyways, what you are looking at, the green that you are looking at uh, is the alleyways. Our research trial is the bare soil in between. What happened? I didn't watch the weather forecast far enough ahead and we had, uh, we had a cold rain. It dropped the soil temperature at the four inch level from the uh, 70 degrees down to 40 degrees, 50 degrees, killed out all the plants. If I back it up one right here, all this here was killed out simply because the temperature dropped after we planted. The other side of the coin is here at University of Tennessee, they put in a plot for me. They planted it on Monday, the soil was warm. Uh, we had a warm rain that night. Uh, by Thursday, it was up four inches and the entire field was rowed. That's how fast it could come out of the ground if conditions are in your favor. If they're not, you're going to be trying to push a string. It just doesn't work. 
And this is critical for organic farmers. You need to have this jumping out of the ground. You don't have herbicides to use. The faster it gets out of the ground, the faster it's going to outcompete the weeds and give you a good crop. The other problem I have with people who are spraying is they'll go out and plant. Uh, and then, uh, oh, two or three days later, they were, oh, I got to get that field sprayed. So they call up their dealer and say, can you come in and spray this? So the dealer puts it down on the schedule. And then a week later, he, he gets to that part of the schedule. He comes out and sprays for you. And what you have out in the field is a whole bunch of annual grasses coming up. When annual grasses come up in sorghum, you are screwed. That's an agro agronomic term. Uh, there are some herbicides coming out soon that may get around that. But at this point, when you get done pulling out of the field with the planter, the sprayer should be ready to roll in, get that herbicide on there. Atrazine and Dual works very well if you have screen or concept treated seed. If you're organic, uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. But the soil, it's, I prefer 65 degrees. Uh, and getting warmer, usually after June 1st for us. Uh, the woolly mammoths are still out feeding otherwise. Uh, broadleaf weeds, you can use 2,4-D and atrazine. What we have used is concept treated or safe in seed. You can't use regular seed, you can't use organic seed and put an, a herbicide on, you'll kill it. You need to have a treatment on that seed, concept or a safener is put on and allows you to use atrazine and dual. Uh, the stale seed bed uh, is for the organic farms. If you don't get it and the weeds get going like this, you got a problem. Uh, now, most of these weeds are broadleaf, so I think we can get that with 2,4-D or atrazine. If this is an organic field, you're screwed. Uh, there's no way around it. You need to get that out of the ground fast. If it comes out of the ground fast, even tough weeds like velvet leaf, which is a real nasty weed, uh, they don't stand a prayer because here is where the drill missed, left a skip in the field. It's a solid stand of velvet leaf. There were no weeds in the rest of the field, none whatsoever. And no herbicide was used on that one either. That's a sorghum sedan. Now for organic, um, what we recommend or suggest is a stale seed bed method. You go out, you work the ground up, you smooth it up, you roll it. You get it all set like it was planted. You let it sit for a week or so, and then you come in and lightly harrow about an inch deep. And as soon as the harrow pulls out of the field, the drill goes in and plants your sorghum sedan, your sedan grass, or your pearl millet. You plant it, and then uh, you're ready to, uh, to roll. For a sedan grass or a sorghum sedan that's going to be grazed, uh, or pearl millet, uh, 40 pounds of seed. You can see we had weeds all over in here. When we went to 75 pounds of seed, we had no weeds in here. So, and it's actually growing better than where the herbicide is because the herbicide in the front here needed to be metabolized. This didn't have to metabolize it and got growing faster. But 75 pounds is too high, I feel. 60 pounds is fine. And the reason for that is right here. Here is our 60 pound rate. Uh, and that one gave us uh, a whole lot less weeds uh, than the lower seeding rate. So we go with a little higher rate on the organic farms for that reason. The other piece, is there any questions at this point? Uh, there was uh, a question about, uh, I know another question kind of about mixing um, species with, uh, you know, you had talked about cowpeas. I've heard people try, you know, sunflower, sun hemp, you know, things like that. What about uh, small seeded clover, like a Bursium clover? All right, there is a mix that is being sold to the upper Midwest. Uh, it is sorghum sedan, ryegrass, uh, several different clovers. I think trefoil might be in there, alfalfa might be in there, hemp might be in there, etc. cetera. Uh, I know the person and I've done uh, seminars for him. I know of details on the crop and I've looked at this very closely. 
The bottom line is what you get out there, if it's cold and damp, you're going to get a lot of ryegrass. If it's warm and hot, you're going to get a lot of sorghum sedan. Uh, if you're going to be halfway between, you're going to have sorghum sedan and ryegrass. You look at the biomass produced from the other species in there, and it's negligible. So the mix does work because it covers both weather conditions, but I don't see any need for those other legumes in there. Uh, simply by adding more nitrogen, you can raise the crude protein level. Uh, the other legumes and other species have not come through uh, in a strong enough way that I see to justify them uh, in the stand. Yeah, that's kind of been our experience as well. I guess even in um, uh, cover crop mixes, you know, the, the small seeded legumes really struggle to keep up. Yeah, uh, it's a nice idea, but it doesn't work. <clears throat> so what that's about, go ahead. Uh, so you recommended 60 pounds the acre for, for organic. What's kind of your recommended rate for conventional? Uh, for conventional seeded, I would go back down to the 40, 30 pound rate. Uh, you really don't need a lot of seed. You need it planted in a warm seed bed and it needs to be planted uniformly and it needs to be planted at the right depth and, and sealed in there with a roller. But those things will do more than just throwing more seed out there. I know you guys sell seed, but still you want your customers to get the best deal for it. Uh, putting more seed out there is not going to help compared to what the farmer does. The farmer needs to look in the mirror. That's where a lot of the management sets with this crop. Uh, you need to put them in right. 40 pounds for a sorghum sedan or a sedan grass is usually enough. We've gone down to 20 pounds on sorghum sedan planted right. The other thing happens is that these species will send out multiple tillers and they will fill in tremendously. You get a gap in the field, by the end of the season, there's no gap there because everybody around it sends out more shoots, fills it all in, and you have a good solid stand when you're done then. Do you see the rotational restrictions as another question about um, planting after wheat harvest with sorghum sedan? Like um, I'm assuming winter wheat, uh, you'd probably wanna work up the, the stubble and not try to no-till, just like you were saying, right? Uh, yes, I would uh, lightly uh, work it up, uh, the stubble uh, only an inch down. The other thing that'll happen is you're gonna get volunteer wheat in it, but that's not gonna hurt anything because the sorghum sedan and the sedan grasses will run circles around wheat in rate of growth. Once they get a head start, they can't keep up with it. I have personally measured growth of three inches a day on sorghum sedan. From a Monday to the following Monday, it grew 21 inches. So uh, it will really haul butt if you can get that stuff in the warm condition, good fertility and up out of the ground. Once it gets above the wheat, volunteer wheat, it's gonna take off and really roll. This, this, I was just kind of personally interested because uh, we've had producers in far Northern Minnesota that, you know, I don't think we have anything to really back this up, but have commented that, you know, obviously in cool wetter years, you know, uh, summer annual species don't uh, get as much biomass. Is there kind of a latitude above which, you know, sorghum sedans don't really make sense? Um, in, it's in more the of a thermometer than a latitude. Okay. Uh, yeah. Dan Under, I did a whole bunch of work in the early 90s with sorghum sedans, and Dan Undersander got real excited about it. He told me later, he said, I came out looking like a bozo because I planted it. It came up out of the ground and it stood there. Uh, last spring, we planted a male sterile in Willsboro, which is right near Plattsburgh, which is right near the Canadian border. Uh, it was a trial we were putting in. It got out of the ground. It looked great. Every time the guy looked out there, he says, that looks really great. He says, the only problem is it absolutely stood still through all of June, half of July. The end of July, it finally got warm. The right next to a lake, which stayed cold. They had very cold conditions the first half of the summer last year, and it would not grow until it got warm. Uh, that's the downside. It needs to be warm. So how far north you can go, it really depends on what you have for a summer, which is a really poor answer but that's all we have to go on. Uh, it can grow like crazy when it's warm and when it doesn't, it doesn't. That's why I don't put all my eggs in one basket. Yeah. 
Fair enough. Appreciate those uh, responses. I think we're caught up here. Okay. Um, row spacing. Uh, we don't like wide rows. Narrow rows, equidistant plant spacing is better for standability and for yield. Uh, this is 30 inch rows. This is the same crop on 15 inch rows. And this is the same crop. Well, this is sedan, but it would be about the same uh, for uh, sorghum sedan planted on seven and a half inch rows. It fills in a whole lot faster. Uh, 15 inch rows, we run into that in two cases. First, the drill I have cannot plant a low enough seeding rate and it's making sorghum flower instead of uh, planting the seed right. So we plug every other hole and produce twice the seeding rate and it comes out exactly right. The other piece is, is using Milo plates on a 15 inch corn planter works really, really well, especially for uh, the sorghums. Uh, the forage sorghums does an excellent job for the stand and the growth of that stand and the standability of it. But the point is, is the narrow it is, the faster we're going to intercept light. There's light hitting the ground here that's being wasted and growing weeds. Down here, there is no light hitting the ground. You're getting maximum yield potential. Looking at this on a full plant, uh, there's a 30 inch row and you're still getting light down in there. Uh, here is the 15 inch row and here is the six inch row. Uh, when you look at those on a yield basis, uh, the tan bars is the seven and a half inch row with different seeding rates. Oops, sorry. The tan bar is the seven and a half inch row with different seeding rates. Uh, when we got uh, up to 30 inches, none of our yields were close to what we had here. Uh, the 15 came close at about, this is about eight pounds of seed to the acre. This is sorghum. Uh, we had 18% more yield and we had better standability and less weeds if we drilled it uh, in narrow rows and then spread those plants out within the rows. That gave us our best all around results. Nitrogen, it is a key to yield. It is a key to crude protein. And I don't think we have a good handle on nitrogen. Uh, guys will say, well, you put on so many pounds of nitrogen per day that you're gonna have the crop out there or uh, how many tons you're gonna have. Uh, we haven't bought any of that. And here's some of the reasons why. This is a nitrogen trial that I did at the Belasa Experiment Farm. Anywhere from zero to 200 pounds of the acre, that was the yield curve. It made no difference. I could have planted the crop, got 20 tons to the acre and had no nitrogen. The key here though, is that this was a compacted sandy gravel soil. I deep tilled it so now the roots, instead of going eight inches, could go three feet down. They were going down, pulling up old nitrogen and utilizing that to grow the crop. So it made a difference. Uh, this is a trial in Texas. And what we find is as the yields go up, the crude protein goes down because the nitrogen is now diluted over more and more tons of material. Uh, I'm glad to say. Uh, uh, Jody Lethem, who is in Upper New York, uh, uh, Cornell Regional Agronomist and I have just got a grant to do a nitrogen trial on male sterile sorghum, looking at exactly this issue. And the reason we're looking at this issue is there's the yield as it's going up, but there is also the crude protein. There is two yield curves. There's a yield curve for yield that I just showed you, and there's a yield curve for crude protein that we have here. And this yield curve says we need to go up to a lot higher. And when you start calculating the cost of that nitrogen and the savings on soybean meal, all of a sudden the nitrogen is a whole lot cheaper than the soybean meal, especially for organic farms. So organic farms need to get enough manure out there uh, plowed down, worked in or whatever incorporated so that they can supply the crop right late into the season and get 10 or 11% crude protein. The other thing is that we were looked at that earlier study that I showed you. This was a one cut sorghum. Uh, this graph is there was no nitrogen applied 
we took 200 pounds off of that field. Here we put 100 pounds of nitrogen on, we took off almost 250 pounds of nitrogen. If you have your roots able to go down because you don't have a plow pan under it, those roots go deep and pick up nitrogen that had leached on by the previous crop and bring that back up again and can help support the crop. It depends very much on your cropping cycle, your manure application, et cetera. But the point is, sorghum species have fine roots that'll go really deep if you can get through the compacted layer. So that's another issue and a whole nother talk uh, uh, on its own. Where you're doing a multi-cut, and again, like I said, we've been doing this is 2000 data, but we've been doing this for a long time. If you look at a multi-cut situation, by splitting the nitrogen, this is not organic, this would be a, a regular commercial fertilizer. By splitting the nitrogen, instead of putting 150 on at once, we put 75 and 75, we had a significant yield increase. Instead of putting 200 on, we put 100 and 100, we had a significant yield increase, simply because we fed just the next crop. I don't have the crude protein data here, but I'll place money on it. The crude protein was a lot higher in that second crop than in the, uh, the one application. Now, the organic people are saying, well, that's no problem. I'll just go out, uh, I'll cut this off, and then I'll come back in and I'll spread manure on top of the cutoff stuff, and that'll supply the next cutting. I don't think so. Uh, this field was mowed off. The guy waited five days. Remember, it grows three inches a day. Five days later, he spread 8,000 gallons of manure. What he didn't burn off, he drove on and crushed. And the results was 85% of the field was dead. Um, I am not a big fan of coming back and top dressing manure. The other part of that is for your organic people, if you're spreading manure out there, 75% of the nitrogen is going off as a gas. It's volatilizing. It's not doing you any good. Now, if you can run a coulter injector in here and inject the manure, then you gain all of that uh, back again. Uh, but coming back in and just spreading manure over the top uh, is a disaster. And then the other part is rotations. Uh, you can rotate your crops in here, uh, 50 pounds of nitrogen. Uh, gave us almost uh, gave us 25, almost 26 tons of the acre of silage. That's a pretty economical crop. If you could get that kind of yield, and that's all the nitrogen you put on. By rotating the crop, you can get yourself to that point. The other side of the coin is this is work done by Dr. Kettering at Cornell. She and I worked together uh, on a number of trials. And if you look on the upper right here, they put on 200 pounds of nitrogen and they still didn't have a yield curve. This was on sorghum, a brachytic dwarf sorghum. They were getting 40 tons to the acre up here. Down here, they were getting about 33, 34, 33 tons to the acre of silage. Sorghum can really produce the yield. You get planted right, and you get warm conditions and enough rainfall, the package goes together, it can crank out tremendous amounts of yield. Uh, these other two, they were in poor conditions. They're still getting 25 tons here. Uh, this one was 15 tons. I know that field, that was a horrible soil uh, that has been abused over the years and didn't have any manure on it at all. So uh, there was a whole bunch of strikes against it. So with that kind of a range, you know, what is your nitrogen recommended rate? We don't know yet. That's why we're looking at doing this research to try to nail it down. Up till now, I suggest people use the same nitrogen as they would with their corn silage and try to put something on that they could put it on a little later or use something like Instinct that holds it in the ammonia form, holds it a little bit later before they put it on. Organic farms, they're putting organic matter on down, plowing down the manure. Uh, that manure is gonna be a slow release. So if you're using like chicken manure, bedded pack, it's gonna be slowly releasing and that'll supply it a lot longer. 
but you need enough manure to do the job. Now harvesting, uh, and it looks like I better hurry up. I haven't got too much time left. Um, harvesting, we've gone with the one cut system. And the basic reason is a one cut versus a two cut, uh, Wisconsin's data and my data completely agree with each other. You get twice the yield in a one cut that you do in a two cut system. And you're getting it at half the cost because you're only going over the field once. Uh, we did that with sedan grass, sorghum sedan and pearl millet. Our highest yield is going to be in a one cut system. Now, the downside of one cut is right here. The stand is up. It's looking really nice. This is the day before Hurricane Irene. This is the day after Hurricane Irene. And this is two weeks later. It's all standing back up again. It will stand up. And with the modern heads that we have today, I deliberately grew a crappy stand of sorghum sedan. We had weeds up the wazoo. I said, that's fine. Let's see if this head can chop it. He walked right through the field and had no problem chopping it. It worked well. And then finally, the only problem we have had is the occasional army worm outbreak. One in 10 years is what I have seen. Cutting height, the multi-cut versus the single cut. Uh, this is data from the, the uh, multi-cut as it got taller. Up through five feet, we had the same digestibility, but you had a lot more yield out there. So that's why we were leaning toward the one cut system as opposed to the multi-cut. Uh, looking at this here, this is the yield. As the yield went up, tons of silage per acre, the milk per acre was almost a straight line. Now, the change that's coming, and this is what I'm gonna talk about now. When we put in male sterile and we let it go past heading, it increases the nutrient content. It enhances the nutrition. These next couple of slides I'm gonna blow through quick because I wanna to get to the end uh, before we run out of time. Uh, corn silage, it's made of plant fibers and sugar and starch. Sorghum is all plant fibers and cell contents. The sugar and starch is in the cell. Uh, the Texas recommendation for harvest of the seed type is when the soft dough is halfway down. I do not recommend that. Uh, when we waited till then, even the brachytic dwarf, 30 to 40% was lodged. And those seeds in the top half are complete waste as they go right through the animal. They don't digest and processing does not break them up. Uh, what we do is when the tip first gets to be the consistency of, saw, of oatmeal, cooked oatmeal, then get in there and start harvesting. Because the seed is about the size of number five, a number three shot, and it's about as digestible as number three shot. And breaking them up makes no difference. And here's your brachytic dwarf that went down. If you're doing a seeded type, Looking at it from boot stage to uh, medium uh, soft dough. I call it Texas soft dough. This is the metabolizable energy from corn. This is the metabolizable energy from sorghum. It's a little bit under, so we have to add some cornmeal to it. This is the metabolizable protein from corn. This is the metabolizable protein from sorghum. You take out some soybean meal and add some cornmeal to do it. The bottom line is, and I have the same, the next piece came also from a guy in uh, California. He had the same slide. I didn't take it from him. I already made mine. Sorghum is not corn silage. And you need to take that, print it up, and put it on the forehead of your nutritionist. Because they have a habit of coming in and saying, oh, well, it's the same stuff. We'll pull out some corn silage and throw in sorghum, and then the cows crash, and they said, see, that sorghum is just a bunch of crap. It's no good. When, in fact, it's the nutritionist that's screwing it up. Now, the other option. This is the breakthrough piece that we have made recently. Male sterile BMR sorghum has no seed head to lodge. The energy is in the sugar and the fiber. It has enhanced nutritional content and a wider harvest window. Uh, this is one in our variety trial. And we have had yields up over 32 tons to the acre with a male sterile uh, BMR sorghum. 
in Albany, New York. In a fertile seeded, as it's photosynthesizing, the leaves translocate to the nutrient seed, which is the fertile seed. It's like a pregnant woman or a pregnant cow. Uh, the nutrients are all being mobilized in the body to support that new baby. Same with a plant. In a male sterile, it's more like a beef steer. Nothing is going up to the seed head. All the nutrients are accumulating in the plant cells and those cells need to be ruptured. So it's a slow, steady release of nutrients in the cow's rumen and it gives a higher rumen pH so you get better components and no processing is needed. You can use a chopper without a $50,000 processor and burning a whole bunch of fuel. Processing is not needed. There is two trials we did in 2020 and in 2022. The non-fiber carbohydrates went up as we waited eight weeks afterwards. And why did we wait eight weeks afterwards? Because it's eight weeks from the time corn tassels till the time you chop it. Sorghum, we give it one week, chop it, and then say, oh, this isn't as good as corn silage, it's a bunch of crap. When in fact, it never was a fair race to start with. When we waited eight weeks and we don't have seeds that are getting hard because it's male sterile, we had an 84% increase uh, in 2022, and we had a 71% increase in non-NFC, non-fiber carbohydrates in 2020. Looking at non-structural carbohydrates, uh, that same time frame, we had 200% uh, increase in 2022, 185% increase in 2020 in non-structural carbohydrates. That's the stuff that makes the milk. That's the stuff that replaces the starch that's in corn silage. But in addition to that, in that time frame, the digestibility of the fiber goes up. Initially it decreases, but once it's done doing any growing, it's just loading up the plant cells with highly digestible stuff. So your NDF 30 numbers are going up. Sugars, sugars in the plant, this blew us away. Uh, in 2022 and 2020, the sugars went up phenomenally. Starch in corn is nothing but 2,000 to 200,000 sugar molecules packed into a tight space and they call it starch. Water soluble sugars in this, uh, in 2020, 2020, it was a 400% increase. 18% of the dry matter was sugar. In 2022, it was 26% of the dry matter was sugar, 500% increase. You put an inoculant with this, we can ferment this in no time at all, simply because it has the substrate under it. And then the other piece is, and this is important, the dry matter increases over time. So you look at the dry matter over time, both years, our dry matters were up to 30% dry matter when we were chopping. Looking at the male sterile, doing what a lot of nutritionists do, uh, we're gonna pull out corn silage, throw in sorghum. Uh, this was the male sterile from 2020. Dr. Larry Chase ran it through the Cornell uh, model and we found our milk production went down because there wasn't enough energy. He rebalanced the ration, fed a higher fiber digest, diet. So he fed more of the sorghum in the diet uh, for the fiber level it contained because it's digestible fiber. And you look here, uh, the milk uh, at the bottom here, get this to come up. If you look here, we have the same milk as corn silage. We had actually more protein in the milk to be supported by the sorghum. Sorghum is not corn silage. You need to rebalance the ration. When we rebalance the ration, we started out at six pounds of cornmeal in the corn silage diet, 20 pounds of corn silage, 15 pounds of haylage, uh, six pounds of corn grain, three and a, and when we did the sorghum, we made it 6.9. Soy plus was three and a half. We took out soy plus because we didn't need it in the sorghum. So it works, it works very well. The last couple of pieces I just wanna hit here and then we'll be done. 
is you're going to do multi-cut, lay it out wide. You need to get that water out fast. If you're using intermeshing rubber rolls, they will shred the stem and help it to dry faster. If, you're, if you have a flail mower, you have my sympathy. They do a crappy job on sorghum's, sorghum sedan. They either just bend it up or they use a huge amount of fuel turning it into coleslaw. They don't work very well. Now, fermenting some of this, uh, this is just one company I did. I did like four or five companies uh, test of different inoculants. This is just one of them. At 18% dry matter, we had perfect pH. Same at 24% uh, dry matter and 27% dry matter. Uh, if we were worried about clostridia and butyric, it needs to be under 4.2 pH. All of them were. Why? That high sugar. The high sugar I was just talking about, uh, we cut this stuff at one inch long and the sugar that does leak out, uh, more than is enough for this inoculant to go ahead and ferment the crop real quickly. So we want to cut it longer so we don't lose that sugar uh, an inch long. Uh, that means less leachate out of the silo. Use a homolactic bacteria, not a buchneri. We get perfect fermentation of the wet stuff, but I don't like making wet stuff because I spend a whole lot of time hauling water. I want to haul dry matter. And then at those kind of dry matters, you can't put it in an upright silo. The silo walls are not going to handle the pressure. So there is no perfect crop. Your management can make or break this crop but it has huge potential. So at this point, I'm gonna shut this down and any questions? Yeah, thanks a lot, Tom. Um, appreciate the presentation. There was a lot of information there. Um, <laughs> that was only half of it. <laughs> <laughs> no, there was a lot of great information. Um, a couple of questions here and then we'll transition. Um, what do you recommend for planting depth on sorghum sedans? One inch. <clears throat> The soil's usually warm enough, and if it, you, know, you time it right after a rain, it's going to be up and out of the ground. I'm captured in between trying to get it out of the ground fast and um, getting it to moisture. Uh, in Texas, they plant it three and four inches down because that's where they have to go to get water. We don't have that up here. We usually have enough water, so an inch, inch and a quarter is usually sufficient. Do you recommend grazing uh, male cereals at all, or is that more of a, a harvest? you know, one cut harvest type situation. That's more of a one cut harvest. Uh, but if you're gonna get the nutritional enhancement, you have to let it go eight weeks. Now you're grazing something that's uh, eight to 11 feet tall. Uh, they're gonna knock down more than they eat. It's a losing proposition. Go with a sedan grass or a pearl millet, a BMR pearl millet, or uh, if you need to, a uh, sorghum sedan. I would mm -hmm. not use the male sterile in that situation. Gotcha. And final question, uh, do you have any thoughts on, you know, uh, comparing a BMR versus non-BMR male sterile? Do you, do you still gain a lot of the benefits from a non-BMR or, or do you still recommend the BMRs? That's the work that's in progress right now. Uh, what we're doing uh, is taking a male, a male sterile non-BMR and trying to harvest it at five weeks instead of eight weeks. Our concern is if we harvest it at eight weeks and we feed it to heifers, that's the target group, uh, we're gonna make them little porkers because you got 26% sugar in it. Uh, but at five weeks, we're gonna be down more at 10% sugar. So we pull the energy back down, but still have the digestibility. They still get filled up and with their slow rate of passage, they get full digestion out of that crop so they do real well without getting fat. And that is research that is in progress right now. Gotcha. Thanks very much, appreciate that. I dropped the, the website um, uh, into the chat there. If people have questions, okay to follow up with you. Yep, yep, you can email me or call me and there is a video on my website uh, on the mail sterile if they wanted to relook at it.